simple. So you introduce a uh, fake scrum, you destabilize the organization so it's not even able to produce like before. Second, intrinsically, when you introduce even fake scrum, you're going to provoke seeing uh, weaknesses and other problems. And so problems are provoked, but because there's no testicular fortitude to actually deal with the root causes, which would involve the dissolution of the existing management structures and specialist structures, all of the existing power structures, because there's no willingness to actually uh, deconstruct all of those structures, those forces which are provoking all of these irritants don't get resolved. So you have a destabilized system by introducing the fake change. It exposes, especially if you've adopted Scrum or some approach of Lean, you've provoked uh, seeing all of the problems and bumping into all the problems. They're not, the root causes are not being solved, which just means you're now in this infinite loop of provoking uh, these problems, the root causes of which aren't getting solved. Then uh, the Typically, you've got a particular class of people who become scrum masters who are the idealists and they heard this nonsense from the senior managers that we're going to support the change and everything's going to be different this time and they go, oh, yes, it's finally going to be get better here, you know, and they have this and then after 16 months, they see the bullshit that's actually going on and their soul starts to become crushed. The scrum masters and the other keeners for the change, they start to become literally psychologically depressed. It's a bit bummer. Um, the really top talent starts to leave because they can see what an F up this is. The uh, best quality managers, likewise. And so now you're now you now you're kind of uh, squeezing out the best people in the organization and the people are, that are willing to call a spade a spade and say, hey, this is all bullshit. This is just a fake change. All of those people have left. So you've only got the yes people left. Uh, those who are into the careerism game. And what's happened, the end result is that you have a destabilized organization with un unhappy people in which all of the fake promises weren't met. Uh, the business side goes, yeah, this isn't making any meaningful benefit for us here. And bear in mind, my specialty is scaling. So I'm always thinking in terms of uh, these forces and scale where they really uh, play out. Uh, and as I said before, your best people have left would have been far kinder to not even start uh, and to move into this, what I call change purgatory space. But what does that mean? Like organizations should not change or like it's better not to even start the exactly. fake changes? Exactly, because the fake changes introduce more harm than the other. And, and you, won't, you won't know that unless you actually work for years inside of an organization that's doing deep change. Not as a coach, but like on the development side. If you're a coach, you probably won't even see this. So that's the problem with that exact, exactly work for the companies that went through changes, like business development changes, um, <clears throat> business transformations, and uh, I knew how it was reported for the headquarter and what happened exactly inside the organization. Oh, before. yeah. Yeah, it was a completely different thing. Yeah, like for example, uh, you know, there's ING Bank in Amsterdam, and then some consulting company wrote up a report about it. That had nothing to do with the reality. I was at ING in Amsterdam, and what that consulting company wrote up was just a load of nonsense. And that kind of thing happens all the time. Okay, uh, so <laughs> that's uh, uh, an optimistic introduction. Well, I'm not interested in being optimistic. The people who are trying to be optimistic are probably trying to sell something. Uh, and I could care less whether anybody adopts less. Uh, <laughs> I really care less. I'm not interested in change fads. I'm not interested in money. Uh, you know, so, so then you can speak plainly, which is neither optimistic or pessimistic, but just trying to actually, and this is my personal mission, which is actually trying to help people see what's really going on rather than just these change fad games and what you could do instead. So what's your recommendation for the financial services? I mean, as you may. It's not, it's, like, it's, just get out of it completely. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Fowler, one of the founders of this movement, 
uh, said, change your organization, and Kent Beck used to say this as well, change your organization or change your organization. Uh, the early folks in the Agile community, myself, Kent, Martin, we always used to say, don't waste any time working in organizations where you can see it's change theater. Just leave uh, or work as a hands-on developer. I see. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm super new to this industry, I'll be very honest. Um, and I've had my own experience in, I've very new, like in the last year. Um, and I'm just curious, I guess it like, maybe it's a question of like, what do you define as success for change? Because for me, I'm, I'm a scrum master, so I'm working at very much a team level, so I can't talk to scale. Right. But I've had people come up to me on my teams and say, since you've been on the team, it feels like a warmer environment and I feel like I could speak up. So even though maybe that institution didn't change at a scale level, I still feel like I made this impact at a team level, which has made me feel so infinitely valued. And yeah. I could go home and feel like I made other people's life. Like I know for a fact they've told me. Um, so I guess I'm, I, maybe my idea of success clearly because I'm at a scrum level is different than other people in this room, like your idea of success. But for me, it's making people feel like they're empowered. And I did that at a team level. And maybe the issue is with scale. How old is the change fad at your company? Three years. Yeah. So, the, and how, how big is your company on the, de on the development side? Uh, I work like at a scrum master level, so I can't say how, like, like uh, we worked at- Are there 100,000? Like, like, Wait, so when did you know you talking to you? Um, okay, so five years, and I want to say how many developers? Eighty thousand. Eighty thousand people. Developers. Yeah. So uh, it's too early, US? and it's yeah. like so. The yeah. point is, it's great to have that experience uh, because that you're a large scale organization. Uh, they haven't yet come and crushed your team. <laughs> I think that is like, what, then what's the definition of success in your eyes? If like finance, financial institutions keep failing, like what, what is it that they're failing at? at? At the change. And so they don't actually have to change the management positions or specialist positions that would actually lead to the deep improvement uh, that's suggested by something like that. And your answer to that is make everyone developers first and then no, uh, but the first step needs to be the elimination of the existing manager and specialist positions, because those are the things that concretize the existing structure. And uh, it's great that you have this local optimization of your team feeling happy. That's a good thing. And more um, successful, like, but, like our metrics are, you know, it, it, I mean, across the board, more successful, but, and I understand that you're coming at it from a scaled point of view, but I still feel like the change still existed on my team. Yeah. And to say not to change at all, I still have to say I disagree because- Well, the, it, pro the problem tough. is is that if you wait around for let's say five or six more years, you'll see quite likely a very different picture in your organization um, because you're only three years into what is a large group. What's gonna happen is that some new change fad is gonna come along uh, because because you're a large organization and you've talked about a local improvement, there's a really good chance that the global improvements are not happening in a meaningful way, which means there's a really good chance that at the very big level, the customers, markets, and so forth, aren't seeing the benefit promised by this change fad. And then what's going to happen very likely within three to five years is that someone, some consulting company is going to come and suggest the blue pants fad. <laughs> and then your senior management is going to give a town hall meeting where they support blue pants and <laughs> on and on. And then uh, what's happening in your organization will all be undone and then it'll rinse and repeat. And there might be periods of time where uh, locally it looks good. But you'll also notice, again, this is because you're young in your career, this is like your first one. Uh, if you stay and pay attention to this for the next, say, 10, 15 years, you're eventually going to go, God, I've seen this movie before. And then what's going to happen if you're, let's say, a top quartile person, is you're going to go somewhere else. And the thing is, you're not the only one who's going somewhere else. If you step back and I'm, what I'm really talking about is like seeing the whole over space and time, big picture, you know, over many years, how this plays out. So you're, you're seeing a little, you're seeing the temporary snapshot of it. Yeah. And that's great. You know, it's like, 
better than nothing. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a downside to these uh, change theater dynamics, as I mentioned. Yeah. So what I got so far is that you need intelligent, wise change agents and a desperate company in order to successfully implement this. And I guess also stability based on your last comment, people who stick around and don't jump ship, that could, those are the ingredients for maybe making a positive. Yes. And this is not only my personal observation. Are you familiar with Dr. Cotter at Harvard? No. So uh, at Harvard Business School, Dr. Cotter is uh, uh, a researcher into organizational change. Who's heard his name before? Relatively well known. And uh, one of his key research results is exactly this. And he ended up writing a book about it called A Sense of Urgency, uh, in which he observes, and I've observed, uh, anyone who works in this world has observed, that without a deep sense of urgency, deep change <coughs> doesn't happen. Thank you. So uh, to your point, Craig, you know, um, if I see an organization, there's a lot of restructuring happening every other year. Is that a sign Just of go history? somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, even if they call that, oh, you know, we're adapting something new or we're adapting to us a new change, but technically what they're actually doing is smart restructuring. Yeah, and are, they, an are these, are these uh, change like, fads coming in from outside or are they created uh, de novo uh, completely internally by the people? I'll probably say, like, for example, I can name out the companies, like, you know, mergers, like, between Aetna and CBS, like, two big giants. No, my, my question isn't that. My question is, you see, you've seen them going through various changes, right. change fads. Right. Were those change fads created inside the company, or did they come in from outside of the company? Outside. Yeah, so that's another pattern. Yeah. Uh, if you see companies adopting a change fad from the outside, that's a pretty strong sign. You don't have a learning organization, you have a copying organization. Oh, yeah, because in the, uh, in the strongest, I would say, learning organizations where deep and sticky change happens, uh, a typical pattern is there's no consulting companies involved, uh, there's no outside stuff, but the people inside create their own way uh, with insight. That's a pattern that I've seen as well. That's why, branching this discussion very lightly into less, that's why less contains almost nothing. There's virtually nothing in less. And the reason why less is an empty box is because there's this inverse relationship between how much you offer and uh, the, how much of a <coughs> learning organization you will have. If you offer some solution from outside, the bigger the solution, the more prescriptive the solution, the first is a pattern, the lower the quartile of the company that would even accept that. Like, I've never seen top quartile companies that would even invite in, you know, consulting companies and take their advice. It's only usually the bottom or second quartile companies that will do that. And then uh, when they take this stuff in, they become copying organizations instead of learning organizations, which just fuels this uh, change fad uh, deeply. Uh, you know, the most ironic example of this is companies that adopt the Spotify model. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just come from Stockholm and I've spent time uh, with the folks at uh, the Spotify folks. And I don't know if you know this, but they consider it a sad, sad joke that anyone would copy them. Number one, um, because they're you know, first message was we have to create this for ourselves. It's critical that a company doesn't copy things from outside, they said, but that you have to create it all yourself. And that's a key part of becoming a learning organization. So they're horrified when they heard this. Secondly, uh, what they do isn't what Henrik described on a web page nine years ago. You know, they, they stopped doing that a very long time ago. So people go around talking about the Spotify model, which isn't even something that they do. Uh, and even when Henrik described it, it wasn't really what they did. Uh, and then further, to go further, uh, like for example, uh, they, they weren't familiar at the time with concepts like local optimization versus global optimization. They were just blind to uh, advanced organizational design concepts. And it wasn't until later when they learned about local versus global optimization, they realized that there were some fundamental mistakes in how they uh, created the Spotify model. Um, 
So it's really, you know, sad in situations like this that you see these kinds of uh, comping's going on. Okay, let's uh, shift it now. And so what I'd like to do for the uh, rest of our time together is an organized uh, Q&A. So I'm gonna uh, give you folks uh, four minutes and I'd like you to get together with one or two people, like the person sitting beside you or behind you. Then in your little group of two or three, figure out who is scribe. Uh, and then talk together, generate questions for me. And then scribe writes them down. And then in four minutes, we'll come back together and round robin, I'll uh, be happy to explore your questions together. See you in four minutes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> 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 Yeah, so 
We're going to come back together in a moment. Please uh, wrap up your questions. Please wrap up your questions. Ding. Okay, let's come back together. So, uh, in the room are some people who are the scribes who have the questions. And now my attention is going to focus on the scribes who have the questions. I'll call you folks the question owners. And you have a question backlog. And I'm going to give you godlike powers, which is that you can prioritize your question backlog for your own backlog. All right. Now, I have a question only of the question holders. Is there a question holder in the room born in the month of January? Ah, can you please demonstrate your godlike <laughs> powers and share with me a question? Um, uh, however you like. Okay, perfect. So, um, we're curious, is there an example that internal changes are better than uh, changes um, inviting external consultant? Because you said that better changes are made inside of the company rather than copy someone else. Yes. Do you have any examples? Like, well, the, 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 the BMW one, uh, the self-driving car, is the most fresh example in my mind. I mean, they started this uh, self-driving cars development earlier than anyone else. No. <laughs> why then? It's <laughs> that's exactly why. Oh, I'm you... sorry. I'm, I didn't think I got the point of that question. Then. No, I mean, they copied already what's what happened in the market, and uh, they, this is this is. Oh, a... Hold on. Um, when I talk about a copying organization, I'm not talking about copying a product. I'm talking about uh, my specialty, which is organizational designs. Right. Uh, so I'm talking about organizations, hey, let's copy the Spotify model. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about copying feature sets or copying products. Are there other examples for, for this, not only BMW? Sure, yeah. Many of the, uh, if you go to Less.Works and you go to the case studies page, um, Almost, if not all of those less adoptions didn't involve consulting companies. Which case studies? The case studies at less.works, the, the website for less. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you are the external consulting company mm -hmm. for BMW and for other examples or someone of your trainers, I think. Well, I, uh, so let me be clear. Yeah. I, I don't mean that there can't be one person who comes in from outside for a company. That's not what I mean. But I mean it needs to be really small where the focus is, uh, for example, that the internal management and others, as much as possible, they create their own organizational design 
through their own insights. Okay, you facilitate now, not now you might need uh, you might need, for example, one in a one in a company, one external consultant in you know a giant company like Bank of America. Let's say they got five hundred thousand people. They need one external consultant who can teach the uh, management organizational design and systems thinking. But not a lot, and then and the, that teaching is not of a particular design or a particular method, but teaching them how to think about how to create organizations. Okay. <coughs> so if you go to less dot works, most of the case studies demonstrate that. Yeah, it was just example. posted in the in the chat this um, mm -hmm. video. Uh, so that was January. A question holder was the questions in February, or in the month of February. Question holder in March. Hi. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, case studies on Lust.Works. Uh, you list a couple of banks there, financial services. Mm -hmm. So, you, there were a couple of examples of Yeah, but for example, the one that I participated, and it illustrates this um, urgency point well. So, this was UBS at, uh, in London, and it was the investment bank side, trading group. And it was uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, so real shocking crisis for the group, uh, you know, severe emergency. And it was in that context uh, that a deep change could be introduced, which of course, and this is especially true in banks, any, in the rare case that a bank will actually create a deep and a deep improvement, in banks, it'll be undone within seven years or less. <laughs> uh, and that, of course, was the case in UBS. And in every, uh, in the rare, over my 40 years, the rare cases where I've actually seen deep change in some part of a bank, uh, I've never seen it last more than seven years. So are you saying that the deep change that you instigated at UBS, was that reversed? Yeah, exa yes, exactly. Okay. Everyone is, it's a truism that every deep Good improvement in a bank will be undone within so seven How many of these less. changes would you say of the the case studies on Lesta Works uh, have been reverted? I don't know, but I would say in general they will eventually all be. Um, I've I don't think in my career I've ever seen. Well, maybe Xerox is an ex uh, uh, an exception. Other than Xerox, I don't think I've ever seen a company in my career that didn't revert uh, their change had changes. Um, and why is that? Well, it's because of the management careerism game. Um, because the, the next change fad comes along, blue pants or whatever it is, and then the managers who want to play the careerism change theater game need to get on that bandwagon, and the management consulting companies want to make money fueling that fire. So that's what leads to uh, then the undoing of the improvement for the blue pants. That's one reason. Another reason is that sometimes um, there might be a senior manager of the group that actually made a deep good change. And it's pretty common that within seven years or less, she's going to go somewhere else. And then guess what happens? Falling apart. Yeah. But isn't that somewhat due to the fact that um, any system will decay? will decay in and of itself. So therefore, energy needs to constantly be, or continually no, be applied. No, um, it depends upon the kind of system. And we need to kind of define our terms here. Um, in organizational design, one of the important elements are structural elements, like the uh, definition of groups, for example, and teams. And one of the things you learn observing organizations is that structural definitions are quite sticky and firm, and they don't uh, decay over time. Uh, if you've got you know, the definition of a group, uh, a place in an org chart with a PNL and a manager, that will often stay in place for years and years and years. What degrades is often practices, ways of working, that kind of stuff. But structures are sticky. Which is why, if you actually want to make deep change, you need to focus on structures. Uh, that was March, if I recall. April, May, June. 
uh, how do you merge the long term uh, change? Like you say, change should happen over time. Organizations should self learn. Where the whole IT uh, industry goes to the gig based uh, model, where people just hire for six to twelve months, yeah. and then won't be possible as far as I can tell. So that's another but, mechanism. But that comment is I don't see that at all in the worlds that I work in. Um, so there, is, there is zero gig economy in the, oh. in the companies that I work in. So Ericsson, Nokia Networks, BMW, there's none of that. So I mean, I understand you're seeing that, but in my market, it's not there at all. In New York, that's almost, mm. you know, 80%. Mm. Yeah, so then it's probably not going to work in New York. <laughs> well, we're only able to do local changes, like on the team level, like Scrum really works, right. but to scale it up, like again, we, we come in, we institute the Scrum, six months success, deliver phase one, whatever, yeah. and gone. Right. Yeah, so, and then eventually and, it'll all be... But people on top is still the same waterfall exactly. and they apply... And people at the middle are still the same. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, often the managers at the lower level are still the same. Yeah. And all that's really happened is Larman's laws, especially law number two, that the uh, terminology of the uh, change is redefined to mean a variation of the status quo. Your project managers are called scrum masters, your business analysts are called product owners and all of this nonsense. Uh, that was April, May, June? June. June. <laughs> July. I'll come back around. Are you July? July. Um, so since you're being somewhat critical of Agile, what do you see as being the next fad that people are going to hop on? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I would have, at one point, I would have predicted that Lean would have had a second kick of the can because there was the Lean fad before. I thought it might come in after, uh, but that didn't happen. What's wrong with Agile again? Uh, <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, part. and it doesn't, it, it, I'm not critical of Agile. That's not my point at all. Um, I, I'm talking about the dynamics of change facts. Uh, Just to add into this question. Okay. What do you think about chances of teal organizations, calocracy? Calocracy is the uh, I have a rule of thumb. Any management fad which involves colors <laughs> it is really not worth paying attention to. So th there is no risk. There is no risk in your prediction that it will be a next Fed, like Calacracy as a next dangerous. Oh, uh, I don't see any traction for it. So I, I would, say, and I really pay attention. So I would say that's unlikely. Okay. But there will be another. Yeah. I guarantee you. You're already working on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that reminds me. You want to become a multimillionaire? Guaranteed? Sure. Yes. Listen up. <laughs> go to five or ten airport bookstores and go to the management section take photos of all of the titles and find the themes of keywords and jargon. Go to the Google word count uh, an analyzer, which you can use to track the frequency of words, and then do some checking of the word uh, in the management space, uh, current buzzwords. But the airport bookstore uh, technique is strongest. <laughs> <laughs> then create the new methodology and the new methodology should include one of those airport bookstore words within it and on the tin should be many of those others now you should always throw in uh time to market customer satisfaction uh reduced cost and better quality that goes without saying <laughs> <laughs> then um, make it into a, uh, make sure there's a diagram which has a, quite a bit of complexity associated with it yeah. and a relatively large book and key point 
make sure that organizations can find a mapping between the existing manager status quo and the, and, uh, the new methodology. And the same thing with the specialists. Um, and then if you then market that, you will make a ton of money. There's just a massive market for that. Uh, that was July, August. <laughs> Oh, yes. I was from August. <laughs> <laughs> September. Just the question holders. September. October. Okay. Um, so in situations where you have seen success or some degree of success mm -hmm. in terms of driving deep change, uh, we're interested in kind of understanding how you would draw the line between the initiation of that effort and actual behavioral change as a result of it. What do you mean by behavioral change? Well, I guess, um, good, 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 good clarification question. Um, um, I think for my team here, but I think basically the thrust is where you can see um, positive result. Ah, uh, so the first point is that that's unrelated to behavior. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a further comment I'll make is that, and that's why I dug into that part of the question, behavior is almost meaningless at the scale that is my focus. So, um, like if we simplify this into, let's say, small world and big world of product development, and let's imagine an entire company is like seven people at a table and they create the software, they handle the customer requests, et cetera. So rhetorical question in that small world context, what are going to be the factors that influence outcome? And it seems to me it'll be things like the education of those seven people, their ways of working, their IQ, their emotional intelligence, ability to work in teams, their environment. It'll be stuff like that, it seems to me, that will influence the outcome of their organization. In big world, let's imagine uh, sort of a medium-sized product, 700 people on a single product, seven cities organized as follows. 100 people in city one, analysts. 100 city in people two, human interaction designers. 100 people in city, 300 uh, architects. City four, front end programmers. City five, mid tier programmers. City six, back end programmers. City seven, 100 testers. My world. Now, if you go to city one, the city with 100 analysts, and you take these factors and you turn the dial to 11 on them, <clears throat> really well-educated people, wonderful people, smart, skillful techniques, great environment. What's that going to do to the total systemic behavior from concept to cash? Absolutely nothing. Because at that, although in small world, these are first order factors, in big world, that's noise. Those are like third order factors and utterly meaningless in the total systemic behavior of the system. Uh, one of the opening conversations was with the young scrum master who was talking about improvement within the team. And that's a wonderful thing. But uh, my focus is the total system, the de delivering a self-driving car or, you know, delivering real features to customers. And in the context that I just described, the happiness of a team, the behavior of an individual team is just noise uh, at that level. So the behavior of individuals, as wonderful as it might be, is just going to be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, and you need to focus at much more uh, influential large factors, like structural factors. Like, for example, it's not until you eliminate those seven cities with those seven sites of single specialist groups that you're ever going to move the needle on adaptiveness and throughput at the systemic level. So what are the... Um with a structural perspective, what are the things that you look to, um, what do you focus on? The elimination of all existing groups and the concomitant <laughs> manager positions. Um, but is that, is that a, 
Is that a goal or is that a byproduct? What is the goal? Condition. That's a, that's a precondition. That's done before the change. The, uh, well, the goal of, um, of less is to create what's called an adaptive organization. So the optimizing goal is adaptiveness, which means that it can change direction in an unanticipated way at no cost with no time and no effort. That's what, if you didn't know, that's what Agile meant from us folks that started this movement. Agile isn't a synonym for fast. Agile is not a synonym for productive. Agile, you didn't know this at the Snowbird uh, Utah meeting where the name was picked, they were uh, dot voting on alternatives. And the number two voted word was adaptive. Adaptive. Because this wasn't about fast, it wasn't about productive, it was about the ability to change direction in unanticipated ways really easily. And that 700 people that I just described in those seven cities, the, their ability to change direction in an unanticipated way would be hellaciously bad in that description. And this is called switching cost in process theory. Their switching cost is high. You can really uh, measure adaptiveness in terms of the switching cost of an organizational system. Uh, and so the measure of success is that uh, the switching cost of a large group is very low. And a precondition for that is the elimination of all existing groups and concomitant manager positions. And also, of course, the complete elimination of projects, programs, PMO, and all of those processes. Because um, projects is the concept of delivering some goal. <clears throat> but fundamental idea of the adaptive movement is the goal changes every sprint. It's a, a, like a lean startup model. You, deliver, uh, you measure, you get feedback, you decide what to do next adaptively, and you do that every sprint, going in completely unanticipated directions, which is the antithesis of a project paradigm, which is achieving some predefined uh, so, objective. So following up on that, it would seem that um, breaking through somehow the, um, the budget process would be critical. Absolutely, yes, good point. So you can't have traditional budgeting driven by projects when you move to an adaptive organization. Um, this is another reason why uh, almost all of these changes fail in, in financial services, because <clears throat> financial services usually have this very old fashioned traditional annual operating budgeting model. By the way, if you've only lived in financial services, you might incorrectly think that all development companies work that way. They don't. Uh, if you go to a real product company like an Ericsson or a Xerox in the development <coughs> groups, you'd never even hear of the word budgets. It just doesn't come up in product companies. It's not a, an intrinsic thing or a necessary thing. It's kind of a, a dysfunctional organizational policy that comes out of the financial services world primarily. Uh, so, in uh, adaptive organizations, because <coughs> projects and annual operating budgets are all about uh, big batch decision making and executing projects, that's of course fundamentally inconsistent with an adaptive approach, which means that you have to eliminate the concept of annual operating budgets and projects driving development. And for organizations that have achieved some degree of success in that, what did they replace it with? <laughs> the usual model. Uh, is to go back to 1905 and Mr. Sloan. Mr. Sloan is the person at GM who introduced the concept of the annual operating budget. And you know the history of annual operating budgets. Here was how or original budgets worked. What are our fixed expenses? Stop. No discussion of what you're gonna do. Just very simply, what are, what's our run rate? And so we go back to that original model. Like if you've got a thousand people working in a, a product group, what's the only question you need to answer from this perspective? What's the total salary? What's their, you know, the building rental cost? You can do that in 10 minutes in a spreadsheet, even if it's a thousand people, that's it. Because there's no discussion of projects or goals that completely goes away. So budgeting becomes extremely simple, but that would mean that your gigantic financial groups that have hundreds of people feeding the beast of your uh, annual operating budget would be out of a job. Yeah. So guess what? It exists. 
the organization exists to support the financial management system and the existing you know management structures but why sorry why do financial groups or companies are trying to do things with the child if they're because of management careerism because if you want to so pay attention if you want a career in financial services you should be you should attach yourself to a agile fad even better you should drive an agile fad put that on your cv watch what will happen <laughs> another financial company yeah. will and, hire you. and this this is anyone who is anyone who pays attention to how to claw your way up the corporate hierarchy in financial services knows that this is the game you play uh, and this is what drives the consulting companies which sell the stuff to the managers to yeah uh that was august October? Uh, October. October. November. 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 You call it you spell it fall. You call it mo Movember? Movember. Yeah. Why? It's a mustache. Protest the yellow cancer. Mustache. Movember, you have to, to wear a mustache. I don't know about this. No, I know sober. about sober October, but I don't know. About <laughs> Oh, you don't know the silver of October? Black month? No, we don't. Yeah, it's really simple. <laughs> don't get <laughs> hot. <laughs> it's actually a good, good practice to do that once a year. <laughs> um, so anyways, mustache in November. Is a soul patch uh, an acceptable variation? Eh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's generally no shave November. <laughs> okay. Uh, December. Bad for shaving top. Uh, <laughs> December. So, uh, <clears throat> How would be the what would be the steps uh, to help the organization to become a learning organization or adaptive organization? Uh, the first step is to wait for a uh, the reaching out from C level, not middle managers, but C level or C minus one level managers from a company that is in a crisis or a true sense of urgency. And if that's not the situation, you're probably just wasting your time. Better to, you know, focus on becoming a computer scientist or a doctor or something like that. Uh, so step one is that don't try to sell this in. That's my key point. If you have to sell the deep change, you're immediately failed. Uh, you can't sell deep change. Either the senior leadership knows that they're in a crisis and wants it, or you're just pissing in the wind. And what kind of crisis would be? The most obvious one is an existential crisis uh, where the company might go out of business. So self-driving car is a good example. If car companies don't make that, they will be gone. Um, but another, uh, the generalization is really a can sense I, of urgency. Can I uh, ask you something about that? Sure. Uh, I mean, car manufacturers, uh, still can live for like 10 years out of their current business. So it's, I, I understand it's really what, what comes next, but the urgency is probably not the way I would understand your urgency. Well, you, the, the urgency won't come from middle managers, but if you've got a quality board and mm -hmm. quality C-level and companies, they will be shitting bricks about the fact that they could be out of business in 10 or 15 years. They'll mm -hmm. take that serious. Uh, but the generalization is a sense of urgency. And sometimes it doesn't come from a threat, but from an opportunity. Like um, naked credit default swaps. Yes! <laughs> we got to get us some of those. Is that too obscure a joke? <laughs> so, uh, so you know what a credit default swap is? It's a kind of a derivative. Uh, you know what like a, a naked call option is? It's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell a call option for my Apple stocks. I don't actually have the Apple stocks. That's called a naked call option. So uh, credit default swaps is a derivative. A naked credit default swap is when you don't actually own the underlying derivative of that derivative. <laughs> and fact, uh, the week before the 2008 financial crisis, the active total worldwide value of naked credit default swaps was here in Manhattan, $7 trillion. <laughs> that's, 
that's the you know thing in one. So I'm making this joke like that this could be an opportunity. Let's get us into the naked default credit swap business or Bitcoin. You know, so it could be a technology which creates this uh, sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Risk or opportunity. Yeah. But it has and to be it has to be pressing. And that's what you know really pressing. I say uh, usually I say uh, change comes into an organization. The organization and rockets work the same way. Unless the base is on fire, they cannot launch into the next level. That's a nice and very I think insightful analogy. Thank you, CK. Yes. So yeah, just to continue the question. So the board feels that there is a threat or an opportunity. So they they can realize that they cannot do what they used to do in order to be successful <coughs> in this new trend or right. new like product. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. So what's the next step? Mm -hmm. They need to realize that there's change will take time, so there will be this deep <laughs> despair, chaos, until some kind of... That's the Virginia Satir change model. Um, but uh, let me dig into the implication of this question a bit deeper. So let me be concrete and take an example like uh, BMW, but it's really like all my cases. Uh, for example, SAP just reached out to me a couple of days ago, the senior leadership, because they want to rewrite all of SAP and they want to adopt uh, less to do this. Um, so, Is it because they're going through like, you know, well, yeah, here, you know, here's, here's a good example of like, I'm not sure yeah, I'm going to, I'm not sure I'm going to take the initiative because they have way too much money, right. but, but, but here's why I might, okay. um, they sell SAP on prem, right? Yeah. There's, they have competitors yeah. that do this in the cloud. Well, yeah. And they can see the trends that yeah. if they don't completely deliver. Yeah. Uh, and they understand they need to support modern technologies and be able to do automated testing. And they know app app or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. utterly fail. So they know the board and the C level and reaching out to me to framing this to me. They know that they're effed if they don't do this okay. deep rewrite mm -hmm. to everything in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And as you can probably imagine, <laughs> that's a big fucking system. Yeah. That's a lot of work. And uh, they got to move fast, uh, not to get the work done, but just to get started because it's a mountain of work. Mm -hmm. So there is this sense of urgency in the sense that they could lose it in 10 yeah, or 15 share, years if yeah. they don't really step up. Uh, so then moving forward. Um, so then how do I work with an organization that then reaches out to me like this? So the first thing that I do, my first email response is, uh, thank you for contacting me. Uh, step one, I say to them, is that um, I'm gonna have to have in the room with me for four days, uh, 40 or so of the most senior managers in the company from all divisions, finance, engineering, et cetera, plus 15 hands-on programmers because I don't want just fantasists in the room. I want <laughs> people in the room who actually know what's going on. <clears throat> and step bullet point two, and then I say before this four day workshop with these people, I need you all to read this 400 pages of preparation material. <laughs> now I used to give that second point simply because I wanted them to do that so that when I got into the room, uh, real basic terminology and concepts were clear so I didn't have to waste time. But I discovered it has a side effect which I didn't anticipate, maybe I should have. For the first time I saw this was uh, Siemens Trains contacted me many years ago uh, for a less adoption and I gave the usual response. And the response I got back was, oh, uh, we, the senior management, we don't have time to study. Uh, we're gonna delegate that to the project managers. Is that okay? So, you know, when you get a response like that, it's just a complete waste of time. And so this creates a very fast filter of whether they're just playing the change theater game or whether the senior leadership <laughs> is actually serious. Like in the, the BMW case, you know, I got a reply 15 minutes later that says, what are the books and when can we order them? You know, and you know when that's the kind of response from the C level that, okay, we've got serious group here that really 
wants to learn. <laughs> then, moving on, uh, they've done the readings, and then we pick a site, and we all go there for four days. And then in the four days, I say nothing. Uh, so to branch a little bit now, and then I'll, I'll, I'll table what I just talked about and branch and then come back. <coughs> One of the things that I've learned about uh, change, and this can be shallow change or deep change, and it can be organizational change or technique or ways of working change is the following. That people need to own and not rent the idea. They have to want to, not have to. And if you don't solve this problem of owning the idea instead of renting the idea, you don't solve that problem, you will solve no problem in change. And so I notice as a pattern, one of the big mistakes of young scrum masters, change agents, agile coaches, is that they go in and they explain the what and that just is useless. You can, you know, tell a group how to do a stand-up meeting or whatever, or what is scrum. But if they don't want to, if they're not eagerly, desperately wanting this, it's just pissing in the wind. And the change isn't going to happen, whether it's a technique like TDD, or a deep organizational design change like less. So, back to my comment about four days in a room and I say nothing. I like to encourage you as coaches and change agents to contemplate the following question. How can I work with a group, whomever they are and whatever the, the change idea is, how can I work with a group so that they own the idea and want to do it? Focus on that. And there's, let's separate means from ends, there's many possible ways that might be achievable. But focus on that, not on the content of whatever the change idea is. So back to the four days in the room. So why I don't say anything for the four days is because then we be back to the usual management consulting company treadmill of consultants coming in and giving the advice and then they're not a learning organization, they're a copying organization, and the people inside, they don't own the change, they're just renting it. So instead what I do is uh, I set up giant whiteboard areas. I cover the walls, floor to ceiling with whiteboard material. And I organize, let's say, the 40 people, C-level managers, programmers, into teams of five. And I give them a giant whiteboard area for four days. I teach them what's called systems modeling and systems thinking, this thinking tool. And then I give them a series of organizational design puzzles. Uh, I don't tell them you know, what the organization should be. I give them a series of organizational design puzzles. And then, you, then them using the tools of systems thinking and me then in that context, coaching them in organizational design elements and the concepts of organizational design, then they figure out themselves how to create an organizational design that's consistent with the goal that they want to achieve. And then they own that insight. That's infinitely more powerful uh, than buying a framework and installing it or asking some consulting company, et cetera. So that's the approach that I like. Uh, I guess several groups come with uh, come up with different uh, design uh, elements. So no, <laughs> no, because it turns out once you learn how to do systems thinking and you understand organizational design, the um, if you have a particular goal like adaptiveness. It turns out that the organizational design elements that will be correct for adaptiveness are unequivocal. They're not a question of opinion. Um, and any group that learns systems thinking, systems modeling, and organizational design, they can discover the standard and unequivocal set of organizational design elements that are consistent with adaptiveness. 
Craig, from yeah. your experience, um, I remember like you mentioned about the DOE defense. Any, you know, you know throw some light on the federal or any kind of those agencies. And how, there's how no use been... doing anything with uh, federal uh, or state governments. I'm not sure city governments, but. Uh, I've seen the agile fad. I yeah. back in the 1990s, I used to give uh, keynotes at companies like Lockheed Martin, etc., yeah. and uh, work with the groups when they were starting the agile fad. Right. And it was trivially easy to see that it was classic Barman's laws. Um, so just as it's a waste of time in financial services, it's a waste of time in the defense industry. They're essentially set up. Uh, to make money for the status quo managers and specialists. <clears throat> and, you know, you're welcome to prove me wrong. Uh, but I think if you actually pay attention to these industries to see if that's what's going on, uh, try to see past the happy talk. Uh, so let's wind this back around, back to January. Well, we also have another one question. Previously, you mentioned um, <laughs> I previously mentioned something about uh, other fads in the past, yes. like lean or something. Why do yes. you think they failed, and what were because of Larman's laws? Yeah, so at all of the change fads they fail because of Larman's laws, and really law number one. So let me repeat law number one. Organizations are implicitly optimized to maintain the status quo for managers and specialists. Which version of six phases you? Uh, before I take your question, so that's why all the change has. There are changes, like if, for example, a CEO of the company is uh, leaving the company. And uh, for a while, there is no one until the, you know, this person will be replaced or a new person is coming and there will be changes. Anyhow, the status quo will be different. No, the status quo uh, won't be different. The labels will change. Mm -hmm. But it will be uh, different teams with different <coughs> ideas anyway. They will... yeah, but the ideas aren't, aren't the real thing. Those are just words. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the actual structure of the organization. Uh, you know, the important, the, the structural questions, which actually influence the organizational system. So let's make it concrete. Let's go yeah. back to the 700 people working on one product, okay. right? The people at the top, the ideas they have is meaningless. It has no influence at all on the behavior of that system of 700 people. Who's there, what they say, the blah, blah, blah. It has no impact at all. The only thing that has any impact on the behavior of the system is the structural elements, the groups, the existence of the teams or the non-existence of the teams, the first order major factors. Uh, that's what will actually uh, be an example of deep change. But what happens in a typical change theater world, like uh, the quintessential example, as I said before, is the existing project managers are called scrum masters. The existing business analysts are called product owners. So the terminology has changed, but the structures have remained the same as an example. And then, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you just told us um, that, that the HR phase is the sixth phase. Um, which the sixth fad that I've seen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which were the five others? Lean and oh, um, lean, agile, lean, rough, rush, rush, rush unified process. Yes. Okay. It was huge yeah. before your time, I guess. Uh, <laughs> CMMI, um, SASD. Oh, six. Oh, sorry, seven. Six. Oh, eight. Lean six sigma. Eight. You calculated Agile as well, so you feel it's, it already failed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it has. It, it is. Oh, yeah. It is ready. <laughs> yeah, because you go to these banks where these all these fake Agile adoptions, and then per definition, it's failed. Because instead <laughs> of actual Scrum, they've just demonstrated Lerman's laws. They've redefined the status quo. So uh, I was talking to a vice president of a financial Institute recently, mm -hmm. and they said that they failed in their agile adoption. And I asked them why. Yeah. 
18 months, they were running agile, spending a million dollar per quarter for building up system, not even a single production deploy. Oh. How can you be agile 18 months, not a single production deploy? So yeah, and, building... and if you were if you were to look into this, almost certainly you would see that the organizational structures didn't change. They didn't change. All that changed was labels and processes. trivial things like processes and yeah. ways of working. And I repeat, at scale, processes, ways of working, it's just noise. Uh, the big forces at scale are the definition of product and the major structure of I could say um, not stable balance between being adaptive and uh, between chaos, actually, because people are calling it, this is agile, this is strong, we don't have time to do any changes, mm -hmm. but in the end of the day, it's just a mess. Yeah, it's exactly. Mess. Classic example yeah. of fake adoption. Uh, that was January, February, March. Oh, uh, yeah, and we have a March here. Yeah, the question that came up was that since it's out there and it's known and going on for quite a while, it's kind of changed the other. Where do you think it, it ends? When, when will it end? Or what, it won't. what could actually stop it? No, it won't. <laughs> what was the question? There's, the question so when, is when will this change theater end? Never. It won't because there's uh, too much money in companies and uh, management careerism is a deep force. We need to report to upper level management that we are in, in line aligned to the market, the recent trends, we're doing the best job. Exactly. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Yeah. Then, uh, as a continu continuation of this question, can we assume that all these previous eight fads actually still running? Still running? Yeah, because like current fad. Oh no, they were they were replaced by the agile fad. Yeah. yeah. So Thompson will replace agile fad. Yes, of guaranteed. Okay. Yeah. And if you want to make a lot of money, <laughs> make no, the next <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes. So if you're saying that the only way to be successful is if you're in a C-suite, a company that's under ex existential threat, then why are we here? I have, I have no idea. <laughs> 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 we, we shouldn't even shouldn't we bother even not trying to nudge the needle towards Agile because... Yes, yes, that's true. I, I observe that the worldwide market for deep change, it's got nothing to do with Agile, yeah. is very, very small. So I recommend that almost everybody in the field become a computer scientist or a, you know, a doctor, get involved in the real world, uh, and then get out of the change fad business. Now, there is a small worldwide market for deep change, uh, a BMW, a Ericsson, etc. And, uh, and that is an interesting market, and it's where I've been focused for you know, decades. So we should have been studying Rust tonight. Ah, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I work as a programmer. I help to coach other people to become programmers. And, you know, I invite you to join the party. Uh, becoming a programmer is a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, as some of you know, I try to make most of my money as a programmer. Uh, so that was that uh, March? March? April. <clears throat> May, June, July, July, <laughs> and this will be the last round to um, December. So yeah, so sounds that the market for deep change uh, is small, it's hard, but here in New York we do have a gig-based economy. So as a scrum master, so on the smaller scale, in a short period of time, by implementing you know, some agile uh, pillars like value-based planning, oh, you know, <laughs> we can be successful. So we, you know. Well, you can be locally yes, successful. Yes, so we can still in, you know, enjoy career as a scrum master. You know, or small team. Yeah, the leader. problem though, like I said at the beginning of the talk, is that when you introduce change theater, it can have a side effect which you don't see at the beginning, which I talked. Did you come in late? 
I came on seven. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I started at 630 if I recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think you came in after I explained the um, the side effects of this local change, which can uh, be quite negative, but I won't repeat them. But if you ask some of the people later on, I can repeat them for you. Um, so that was July. July. You were saying in July? Oh, yeah. July? Uh, no. Uh, no, August. he just has a question. <laughs> okay, we're going to get to August in just a moment. <laughs> July? Oh, August. Okay. August. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Woo. coughs> okay, so besides that, there's like other like large scale framework out there, like Scrum as Go and Safe. Like, how can organization choose that? What's I don't. I recommend they don't choose any of them, and I recommend they don't choose less. <laughs> Otherwise, I fail to make my point. Um, and I'm not joking. Uh, I recommend that organizations don't copy things in from outside, but that the senior management themselves learn the skills of systems thinking, systems modeling, and organizational design. And like Spotify recommends, you create your own thing with insight. <laughs> Now that kind of then begs the question, like why have something like less? So this takes us to Shu Ha Ri. Uh, so this is a scale of the prescriptiveness of approaches, frameworks, methods. So things that are highly prescriptive, for example, the RUP uh, back in the 1990s had many roles, artifacts, processes. Uh, you would buy it and install it. And if you didn't know this, I don't know much about SAFE, but I do know that the creators of RUP then went on and created SAFE from RUP. I know that. So it's the same thing. A lot of prescriptions. I don't know the It's just a theory. And then down at the very uh, low end of prescriptionness, for example, you've got the fifth discipline book from MIT, Sloan School of Management where the advice is simply systems thinking, be aware of mental models, have the ability to create shared vision. Um, you know, slightly up from there, uh, Kanban. <clears throat> um, slightly up from there, Scrum, et cetera. Now, um, this scale, I often like to say, the P is not only for prescription, the P is also for poison. <laughs> and the more that you move up the scale and try to introduce them to an organization, the more you're poisoning them into becoming a copying organization instead of a learning organization, and therefore, I suggest, undesirable. Well, the conclusion of this is that we should be down here. If one, only one person is going to come in from outside of a company, what should you advise to the company? Well. For example, suppose BMW invites me in or SAP, and then I say to the C level of SAP, I say, uh, please listen carefully. Think in systems. Thank you. And I stop. No, that's actually excellent advice. But there's a point here, first promoted by Alistair Coburn, one of the uh, progenitors of the adaptive movement called Shu Ha Ri. This is uh, the journey of a learner in the martial art of Aikido. It could be uh, somewhat loosely translated as beginner, intermediate, advanced, but it doesn't capture the flavor properly. So for example, um, when I was 11 years old, I wanted to learn how to ride a horse. And so I went for riding lessons, and to this day, I remember riding lesson number one, which is, you know, I wasn't very tall, still not, wasn't very tall, and I'm beside a horse. I was a big animal. And I immediately had the sense, if I don't pay attention here, I could get seriously hurt. And so I turned to the teacher, and I, I said to her, I'm going to pay careful attention. Tell me what I should do. And that's really what Shu uh, reflects. It's this beginner phase 
where the key point is you're extremely open to wanting to just adopt and follow the pattern because you're in that place. In the ha phase, uh, now I didn't have a life writing verses, but I do play the guitar, so so. Um, but I might be like at this phase as a guitar player. And in the ha phase, you're now breaking away from patterns. Like in the shoe phase, uh, let me figure out how 12 bar blues works. Okay, do that for three years, and then you go, can I do 13 bar blues? You know, can I go to an A diminished here? And you start to break away from the patterns and explore variations. That's the hop phase. Now, getting back to the key point, how much poison to give an organization, recognizing that moving up here is dangerous. So we would always like to be here. But if you have a shoe level organization, like, like the BMW self driving car group, if you just say to them, uh, listen up, think in systems, it's not tangible enough for them to do anything. They would have no idea what it's doing at all. And so then you want to introduce a little bit of concrete stuff and like the barest minimum, by the way, some of you might remember back in the 90s when we started this movement, one of the mantras of this movement was barely sufficient methodology. If you remember that, well, there was a key signature phrase that we always used to say, barely sufficient methodology. The idea of the Agile movement is introducing the outside the least possible to prevent those dysfunctions of copying organizations, etc. So that's what we're trying to do with something like, like less. You know, even the name less itself is meant to suggest less, uh, not as an acronym for large scale scrum. It's meant to be a very small amount. And then ideally, we would like organizations to give up less and then become a true learning organization, develop their own thing internally. Uh, does that answer? Yeah. And there was another August, if I recall, Artin? Yeah, my question was, you know, about you are referring to many fails of different companies in adoption. And we several times say that Agile fed is also died or almost No, died. no, I didn't say it died. No? I said it will fail. Will the process. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's died. And, and there are many companies where it's clearly failed. I mean, based on your observation and the observation of your closest network circle, what, what is the proportion or what is it, how it's spared between failed and successful organizations? Or it, I'll answer the question a little bit differently. It seems to me that the world, worldwide market of uh, companies for deep change is probably under 500 in the entire world at any one time. Which is not exactly the question you asked, but I think it's an important point to bear in mind. Uh, September. Yeah, hi. I'm not September, but can I just follow Please. up? Because I was curious. I was yeah. dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I, was just, I was really curious if there are parts of the world where companies are more open to organizational change, if you find it not. No, I've never, and I work around the world yeah. all the time. Yeah. No, the same. Yeah, it's, the dynamics are all the same. What are you most proudest of in terms of project or uh, adaptation that you were able to lead as a, you know, I guess as an outsider or maybe as an insider, what is like your proudest like moment that gives you joy in this field? What gives me joy is when um, a big organization, a, a large organization, like a thousand plus people, uh, if they do a deep change and uh, they own it, and so then when problems arise, they don't blame the framework or whatever. <coughs> they look to themselves and uh, introspect and figure out their solutions. That's, that really uh, gives me joy as a generalization. Can I continue on this question? <laughs> Assuming company changed really deeply, right? There is a middle level of management that actually should either 
leave or change to developers? They're right? eliminated in a less adoption. So yes. what they what they mostly do in this manager? It leave? depends. Um, so for example, at Amazon, you might have noticed uh, in July they made an announcement uh, that they're eliminating a hundred thousand manager positions, and they're going to offer them retraining to become programmers. Um, and I would say that's the general trend. A, a very important thing to understand is that in software development, you don't need managers at all, even if there's hundreds and hundreds of people involved in Scrum and unless the whole thing can be done with self-management. So that old traditional role of overhead coordination, that just goes away. And so really the you know, only meaningful positions in uh, modern software development organizations is as a computer scientist. How, how, do, how willing are those managers to change, revert back to development? Not usually. So they'll usually go to another company uh, where they can do the traditional thing or change theater. That trend is everywhere, not just in software. General management people are losing jobs, yeah. they're moving out because <coughs> people don't want to be managed. Nor do, they, nor do they need to be. They, they don't need to be. Yeah. They're smart enough. Yeah. Anyways, I want to get through the months. We're at September, I think. October. November. December. All right. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up with a bad joke, and then I'll be around for a little while if you have uh, questions you'd really like to ask. Uh, let me see. <laughs> A man walks into a bar, goes up to the bartender, and orders a triple shot of whiskey. Looking depressed, sad. And the bartender says, hey, what's wrong, mate? And the guy says, oh, well, I think my wife, who I really love, I think she's going deaf and she can't hear anymore. And the bartender says, well, don't jump to conclusions. Why don't you start off in a very indirect, delicate way and just kind of go home and kind of measure about how far away she can start hearing you. Let's start with that. He says, okay. So he goes home, walks into his house, front door, sees his wife in the living room, and so he calls to her and he says, hey, honey, what should we have for dinner? Nothing. So he goes closer. Honey, what should we have for dinner? Still nothing. Third time. Honey, dinner? Still nothing. Then just like a meter away. Hey, honey, what should we have for dinner? And then he hears, for the fourth time, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> he was stiff. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh,